Um, so Lima's uh, done a great job of setting the scene for uh, the background, the genetic background for um, the basis of what we see in terms of aneurysms, um, but putting it into practice and deciding how we assess patients and monitor them is a real challenge and is a great pleasure to introduce my colleague um, Professor Christoph Nienaber, who's got a wealth of experience um, in managing these um, patients and, and managing the surveillance. Um, and um, I'm going to hand over to him now to, to guide us through an overview of this. Thank you very much, Jasmine. It's great to see you. <coughs> I'm just recovering from a little bit of a bronchitis. Oh dear. Uh, <laughs> it's a great to join. Great <laughs> so Thank I you for joining us. <laughs> no problem. I mean, I was really looking forward uh, to this event and uh, I'm very grateful for you to have me here and for me to be part of this program. Let me try and share my screen. Is it coming up? Yes, it is. Thank you. OK, um, again, uh, both of you, Antonio and, and Yasu and, and, and Lima, for the kind invitation uh, to this meeting, you set it all up and you, you share it and you picked some fantastic topics. I think that, you know, basically let one on it on, on the other very nicely. And uh, Lima, thank you for the lead in. But my task obviously was quite a broad one as I was given the title screening, surveillance and management of patients with aortopathy. So we know a little bit already of the genetic underpinnings, but there will be a little bit of a rep repetition during my talk. Um, let me just go on and move it. We are basically with the aortopathy topic and the aortopathy clinic and the mission that we have covering all ages. This is one example of one of the oldest patients that suffered from an acute type A dissection. Actually, Professor Debeke himself at age 95 was misdiagnosed with an MI and it turned out that he had a type A or Debeke type 2 dissection at the age of 95. Just one example of many, how complex the situation can be. And he actually had difficulty undergoing surgery. At that time, a relatively simple surgery with the replacement of the ascending aorta only and no valve, valve work at all. At the other spectrum of patients, we are dealing in the aortopathy clinic and with the idea of caring and managing aortopathies with young patients. This is a 27 year old young lady with a syndromic feature who developed aortic dissection during pregnancy. You may have already noted the fetus here. Almost prior to giving birth, she, she succumbed to a difficult dissection involving part of the arch and the descending aorta. Again, this is a typical spectrum from very young ages and even from, from uh, adolescence to the old ages like Professor DeBakey. And just to can be considered a problem in mid-air or in mid-life, like in this case. What you can see is a plane that has a problem, like an aortopathy, but still can fly. You can live a normal life. Systems are all working, no multiple future. But what would you do? Would you lower the speed, like medical management only, or would you be inclined to do something actively, surgery, or something uh, more endovascular? This is a more recent uh, recommendation from the New Haven group that came up with this little table that I personally find very intriguing and it shows that not only the bare dimension of the ascending aorta is triggering the need for active intervention, but also the integration with specific genetic mutations. We have already heard about the TGF beta receptor one to three pathways, <coughs> the ECM genes, and of course, the more more well known uh, other other genes that are involved in the formation of an aortopathy. And according to the experience, there's no level one data, of course, but according to the experience and registry data, we get the feeling in the community that in certain conditions, the sh the the indication or the threshold for active treatment in the ascending aorta should be moved down to even down to 4.5 or 4.0 centimeter total diameter at the level of the uh, aortic root. So this is just giving you the flavor of not only morphology playing a role, but other factors such as genetics and probably not well-defined confounding factors that I'm touching on later in my talk. <clears throat> 
we heard about Marfan a lot in our uh, system or our aortic clinic. The patient who has been diagnosed with the help of our geneticists with Marfan's or with clinical features, of course, undergoes regular imaging using echocardiography, which gives us an impression of the root in most patients, MRI and CT angiography if needed. And those uh, modalities will be repeated in usually annual intervals together with physical examinations. And that again starts after an intervention early on after three months and again in an annual interventions. But uh, rather than looking only at the dimension of the root or uh, the dimension of the ascending aorta or other parts of the aorta, we had, had to learn, and there's <clears throat> actual evidence in the literature that newer parameters such as the longitudinal elongation of the ascending aorta shown in this graphical display of a type A dissection as compared to a normal aorta on the left hand side also predicts the likelihood of an upcoming dissection regardless of the dimension here. And we know from the International Registry of Aortic Dissection that 55% of dissections occur at a parameter at a diameter less than 5.0. So other parameters from CT imaging or from clinical uh, examination need to be taken into consideration. We heard about Lloyd's Dietz syndrome, which is a more aggressive form of a, a red heavy connective tissue disorder. Again, a similar workup is usually offered to them together with and alongside with, with a genetic workup. Um, interestingly and more important and slightly different from Marfan's is the need for visualization of uh, the central vascular tree and particularly the uh, cerebrovascular system because of the incidence of uh, focal aneurysm and uh, spontaneous dissection of all parts of artery trees in the body. So not only the aorta is in the center of interest, but also in regular intervals, imaging of the brain, the brain vasculature as shown here, and particularly the uh, supraaortic branches need to be done because there's all sorts of pathology evolving over time, totally asymptomatic, but possibly leading to a detrimental outcome. Again, this is an iconic picture of one of our patients that shows you the need for cerebral imaging as well. But there can also be something done other than open surgery. This is one of our patients that had been collected uh, together with another center, um, a patient who had been operated over already three or four times in the past with various thor thoracotomies. The whole ascending aorta was replaced, the mitral valve and elephant trunk. Elephant trunk added, ended here and caused a secondary type B dissection, which was eventually treated with a successful endovascular intervention, even in such a case of, uh, of Lloyd's Dietz syndrome. Sometimes it is necessary and today even feasible. Uh, needless to say that uh, the vascular endless danlos type syndrome needs to be mentioned in this context. We heard about the uh, COL3A1 gene to be involved in many cases. Again, the problem here is that in whatever vascular territory dissection can occur spontaneously with no increased di diameter of the uh, requested, uh, the respectable part of the body or the part of the vascular to be to it as a warning sign. So this can happen very spontaneously. Just uh, for completeness sake, I mentioned coarctation, which is sometimes seen in context in the context of both syndromic and non-syndromic bicuspid aortic valve condition that today can be treated in the vascular or cardiovascular aortic team with a relatively <coughs> atraumatic stenting procedure as shown here to uh, basically obliterate the obstacle that causes sometimes further progression of the ascending aortic pathology, heart failure, hypertrophy, hypertension of the upper part of the body, and all sorts of other complications. It comes in uh, not an insignificant amount of cases in the context or together with features of bicuspid aortic valve disease or condition, I should say, in particular with the type zero, Type, uh, bicuspid aortic condition, we see um, the, we see the con the combined occurrence and phenotypic presence of either an aneurysmatic uh, formation of the ascending aorta or even an association with a coarctation segment. And even a cardiologist can see that this is an autosom autosomal dominant trait, which basically implicates that all first degree relatives 
of a patient with an identified BAV should be screened for the same pathology or even for pathology downstream in the aorta, such as coarctation. Here's another example that shows you the uh, development of an aortopathy in a type 0 a bicuspid aortic valve, which of course needs surgical attention. There's various subtypes that don't need to be, be separated in this talk here, but it's important to screen these patients and then follow up with imaging and identify the pathology. With regards to imaging, there's new imaging uh, concepts on the way, like for the MRI that gives us an idea of flow pattern and flow um, eddies within the pathology, within the ascending aorta, which probably identify patients at higher risk than others that show a normal flow pattern. So this is work in progress. It's basically research on the clinical front, but it may uh, incur and it may actually deliver us some more information to uh, select patients at higher risk for complication and an earlier need for an operation. And as I mentioned before, in the setting of bicuspid phenotype of the aortic valve, you may find syndromic patients with uh, the, the FBN1 gene, TGF-beta receptor 1 and 2 genes involved, and even ACTA2, as well as non-syndromic patients, the more frequently occurring ones, among which the notch one is the most frequent genetic mutation. But again, this is a phenotypic separation, but there is genotypic, genotypic and underpinnings in almost all, all cases. So family history is in particularly important. I mentioned that imaging is important and some new ideas in terms of identifying patients at risk come from this flow displacement map, uh, which is basically generated by functional MRI uh, protocols. What it shows here for, for those that don't see these images every day, is basically a patient who is completely healthy with a flow pattern in red into one direction only. Here in the middle, there is a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve and a non-dilated ascending aorta, basically a patient with a bicuspid anatomy, but no critical aortopathy. And below on the lower, uh, on the lower line, you see a patient with a dilated ascending aorta, so-called aortopathy in presence of a bicuspid valve that shows you a flow reversal within the dilated segment of the aorta, red forward and blue backward. Basically a big kind of eddy sitting in the ascending aorta and uh, exerting stress onto the outer wall of the aorta. This is probably a benign bicuspid anatomy, whereas this with a dilated ascending aorta represents a more aggressive type that needs early attention and surgical replacement. But again, this is early days, but it leads into therapy and therapy cannot be covered in this talk without mentioning some of the newer ideas to prevent further dilation or extensive aortopathy or even dissection in cases of early expansion of the ascending aorta, which may happen in Marfan's in all sorts of other condition and even in bicuspid aortic, condition, aortic valve condition. Here's what I'm talking about. It's called the so-called Pierce procedure or preventive concept wrapping of the ascending aorta in order to prevent further dilation. It's basically a personalized item which is wrapped surgically around the ascending aorta, either in a lower way or in, an upper, in, in a more extensive way. It includes the coronaries and prevents, as shown in this example, ex further expansion of a slightly dilated root over 10 years. This is the same patient in 2004 and in 2014 with no geometrical changes and no dimensional alterations in the ascending aorta and the rest of the aorta. The patient is a Marfan patient and is still alive, of course. Here's a closer look. It's a fabric, um, basically, um, individualized to the anatomy of a given patient and then an experienced surgeon needs to basically take care of the outer, uh, mo the mo mobilization of the ascending aorta and wrap this around it, leave space for the coronaries and basically uh, close it tightly in order to prevent further expansion in the future. Speaking of surg surgical therapy in the setting of aortopathies, of course, those two names are highlights in the medical history. Uh, Professor Magdi Yacoub 
and Professor Taran Davis developed similar techniques, slightly different techniques to basically replace the ascending aorta in chronic situations of aortopathy by a so-called root remodeling technique, which leaves parts of the root out, or a root inclusion technique, which basically encapsulates all the root tissue, which may have a better long-term by Taran Davis. These valve, valve sparing root replacement techniques have even been adopted in the setting of acute type A aortic dissection, as shown here in a registry, the international registry again that had been mentioned before. Up to one quarter of patients with type A dissection in experience centers undergo a David procedure or Yaku procedure in, even in an acute setting. So these techniques have been adopted worldwide, whereas the Pierce procedure is just in its infancy. All these arch involving surgical treatment concepts are based on early works by Hans Borst back in the 70s, who developed major uh, groundworking um, concepts of arch and ascending aortic valve, aortic uh, replacement, including valve replacement and valve repair, which basically emerged into hybrid procedures that basically combine a surgical part and an interventional part as, as illustrated here, or even a frozen elephant trunk, which is nothing but a surgically implanted stent graft. This is completely new, it's evolving, and there's not much database available yet. So not, the database available so far is, is not randomized data, it's just observational evidence and registries. But speaking of these modern concepts, I have to basically carry on and tell you that parts of these chronic conditions can now be completely endovascularly addressed. There's endovascular technology available, <coughs> which is basically used under a surgical surgical type and in, in a surgical type environment in a hybrid room that allows imaging, intervention, and sometimes even conversion into open surgery if needed. So this modern hybrid interventional work combined with surgical assistance or the other way around surgical work with endovascular interventional assistance has given us great options how to treat patients that had been previously operated, like these Marfan patients who developed a secondary type D, dis type D dissection, which had been stented with a side branch concept and has over time remodeled very nicely. So this is all ongoing and industry is supporting this. This is a full arch replacement concept, totally endovascularly, which we have done for the first time in the UK last year by uh, basically excluding a big arch aneurysm with two, a two com component device. Uh, the result is shown here that excludes a big aneurysm that, that was sitting here in the lower curve of the uh, aortic arch. But again, working endovascularly in this territory of the ascending or in the arch is maybe too early days and too dangerous because we see late or intermediate a complication like shown in this case. And this is a, a graphical display of the motion of the aorta on the right hand side. You can imagine that in such a mobile ascending aorta, a stent graft or even a surgically implanted stent can cause erosion and late complex such as false loop, false aneurysms or even a secondary type A dissection like in this case, which then later was converted to open surgery. So it's a very complex anatomy with a lot of mobility and functional features that we not completely understand yet. Still, at the present time, we rely on classic imaging, and this is an example of classic imaging employed in a patient who presented with acute aortic syndrome. He looked entirely normal from a phenotypic uh, point of view, but later turned out to be a, a, a SMART3 mutation. But what's important here is that guided by the clinical presentation and repetitive bouts of pain, we elected to image this patient repeatedly within three weeks and didn't miss this evolving dissection within three weeks uh, because of repeat imaging sessions and a very close surveillance on an ambulatory basis. And then at that stage, within three weeks, we decided to just go ahead and stent this case. Normally, the evolution of acute aortic syndrome and classically, it takes much longer. This is a traditional way we were used to look at type B dissection or type A dissection in the residual descending dissection uh, in the descending part of the thoracic aorta. 
So we basically look at the true lumen, at the false lumen, we measure distances and diameters and total diameters and basically line them up over, over the years. Obviously, looking back from what we know today, this is not the right way to follow these patients. It's probably very difficult to operate on a patient at this stage who could have been benefited from an earlier intervention much sooner. But it's difficult to keep track of all this imaging information because the intervals are not really standardized. We have to look at various dimensions in ortho orthogonal views, in oblique coronal views, and in sagittal views. And to integrate all this information can be very bit difficult. And, and just imagine the turnover of stuff at, in the radiology department and, and the turnover of attending um, cardiologist on a given patient over nine years or even over one year is, is difficult to keep track on all these changes. So we recommend to condense and collapse all this information into one graphical display. And I show you this example, which I really love on two different, on three different CT scans on a single patient. And what you see here is a transformation of images into a graphical display. You see here the annulus of the aorta, of the aortic valve, and you see here the bifurcation in the abdomen. And here, the various points to measure, the annulus, the uh, sinus of Valsalva, the ascending aorta, the uh, uh, sinus tubular junction, the, the arch, then the descending aorta, the abdominal aorta, and then the bifurcation. And you note that in the first scan here in blue or in green, in 2008, in June, that was the first baseline scan, then three months later, basically no major changes. And then a couple of years later, you see, I, Ideally, and even a layperson can identify the progression on one in one view of of serial images done over the years. So this is, I think, a modern way and an intelligent way to display progression in a given patient. But is imaging and the notification and the following of, of progressive changes the, the holy grail of aftercare? Is that enough? I was uh, lucky enough to be invited to comment on, on the recent AHA statement paper on imaging of uh, patients with aortopathies. And we came to the conclusion with my co-workers, Fortunate and Shun, that this is probably not enough. We need to integrate more information in our aortopathy clinic than just imaging. And I invite you to spend a moment with uh, some new aspects of beyond imaging collecting information beyond imaging to select patients for better care. One of it would be a refined imaging which integrates stress onto the aortic wall. And this is a picture, an iconic picture of a 4D MRI again with stress maps onto the ascending aorta and the outer surface of the ascending aorta in order to identify areas of focal stress that are probably likely to cause focal problems or a dissection as the tissue here uh, su uh, sustains less tensile forces than other areas of the aorta in, in specimen from, from real patients. So this is a recent contribution that obviously flow imaging or focal stress imaging in addition to the anatomic features is the way forward. And our, our, our statement to this paper basically was, was clear, it's probably not enough because it's intriguing to incorporate other markers of uh, ident ad or other markers of inflammation of personal individual features uh, of potential drug effects and com comorbidities, of course, of a given patient and integrate this into a futuristic, smart and adaptive risk prediction model. Computer simulation can also help to uh, evaluate um, the near or far outcome of the natural course, if we understand the signals in imaging, including uh, flow mapping. And we basically finalized our statement with the statement that surveillance imaging should be embedded into a framework of multidisciplinary cooperation in the neotic center or care group. And risk prediction requires a holistic approach on an individual patient with morphology as only one component. What are the other newer component that should be possibly integrated in future clinical research. There is uh, some published evidence that circulate, circulating microRNA signatures can help to identify patients at risk for their aortic um, aneurysm, no matter where it is, to rupture. This is pre preliminary, preliminary work 
and needs to be validated, of course, in the future. In addition, there is some papers out that focal imaging using uh, markers of inflammation such as FDG, PET, can help to identify patients are likely, that are likely to rupture. And more easily, actually, we can resort to a risk calculator that estimates the risk of a type B dissection based on features of the index CT angiogram, including not only the presence of connective tissue disorder or the absence of it, which basically means genetic information, but also maximum dimension circumference, circumference of the false lumen only, identifiable aortic intercostal arteries, and the outflow volume of the false lumen, which can be calculated by certain algorithms in radiology. If you compute that in a very simple computational model, you come out with a two-year risk prediction of death. And in a patient who would probably be under medication and followed conservatively, this particular patient underwent surgery uh, stenting because of a risk of 22% of death within two years. The procedure looks like that. You see the case here with a type B dissection. A surgical intervention was done to combine, uh, to bypass the left, left subclavian with the left carotid artery. Then the orifice of the left carotid was sealed with an occluder device, which I placed here. That was followed by placing a stent graft in the proximal part of the dissection and followed by a petticoat, which is an open stent downstream in the abdominal part of the aorta to re-oppose the lamella to the original location and help remodeling the complete aorta. And finally, the entry tear, the re-entry tear in the left iliac artery, which you can appreciate here, was sealed with a shorter stent graft in this central part of the common iliac artery. So that would be the preferred way to deal with a complex case of type B dissection with a given risk calculated. And as you know from various publications, once the initial hazard period has been survived, the course after treatment like that is fairly stable. But let's not finish this presentation without the need to monitor the patient in terms of blood pressure. Blood pressure, we know all, is the most frequent driver of aortopathies and dissection, even more so than any kind of hereditary connective tissue disorders because it's affecting so many people. And I want to highlight this paper shown here on the left-hand side, which is an original research article recently published in Circulation, looking at big data, blood pressure data on a total of 500,000 patients from the UK Biobank, 500,000 patients from a Japan corresponding Biobank, and uh, an additional six studies published in a meta-analysis comprising 2 million and 500,000 patients that were followed for up to eight years for the incidence of dissection in relation to blood pressure. And uh, I had the privilege to comment on it and my editorial to it was called basically taming hypertension to prevent aortic dissection. Do we use or should we use a universal new normal blood pressure to treat our patients? And this is a summary of the results. There is, of course, first of all, a nonlinear dose response on both systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure versus the risk of aortic dissection. And the most important thing is we are talking here about blood pressure in the usually accepted normal range under systolic 140 and diastolic uh, of 90. So if you look carefully at this threshold here, it becomes significant that at a systolic blood pressure of 132 or above it and a diastolic blood pressure above 75 or more, there is an exponential increase for the risk of aortic dissection based on these big numbers and appropriate statistics. So in other words, our patient before and after dissection should be treated in a way to prevent extension of dissection or new dissection which means that the systolic blood pressure must be lower than 132, at best at the lowest tolerated blood pressure right here, which would not increase the risk ratio for, for later uh, development of aortic dissection. And you can imagine that it needed such a big number of two, th two 
million five hundred thousand individual cases uh, considering the low incidence of aortic dissection to prove this in a statistically very solid way. Let me finalize with my take home mess messages. I think over the last two talks, we heard that the diameter threshold for preemptive aortic intervention, in particular surgery, should likely to be adjusted to a patient specific feature, including genetic information, et cetera, individual inflama inflammatory information, et cetera. And an early intervention or surgery should be modified by those hopefully diagnosed genetic underpinnings. Markers of inflammation, which are now developing and becoming a mainstay in a clinical arena may help to identify the need for surgery regardless of dimension as well. So in the future, I believe that our view onto aortopathy should not be only a morphological view, but should integrate individual information from genetics as well as from metabolics or inflammatory reaction that could be identified by either microRNA or PET imaging. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Christoph, for that um, lovely overview. Uh, lots of information there. Um, in the interests of time, because we're running about 10, uh, 10 to 15 minutes behind, um, there's one question in the chat, which I'll come to later on to give um, to give an answer to that. Um, but in the interest of time, I think we'll move on to our third talk for this morning, uh, sure. sorry, for this afternoon. Um, but you'll be around later on, Christoph, um, just for any questions. I'll be around, so. yeah, yeah. I'll be so, around. Um,